Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Moyer, author of Win Again, speaker, career coach, and business advisor. And I help athletes, executives, and entrepreneurs reach their fullest potential. What you're going to be hearing in every single episode are conversations with athletes and other sports-related influencers. And we'll be offering you the insight that you need to succeed in life, including advice that will let you jump past your competition, whether it be for a great new job or taking your business to a much, much higher level. Make sure to connect with me on social media at Mark Moyer Coach and go to my website, markmoyer.com, to get access to the tips and strategies that my coaching clients get directly. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email to mark at markmoyer.com and I'll get you going right away. Thanks for joining me today. It's going to be an awesome episode. Now, are you ready to make your mark? Let's do this. Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. My name is Mark Moyer and I'm broadcasting to you live from New York City. And I'm super thrilled to have you on board wherever you are. If it's here in New York City, somewhere else in the United States or anywhere else on our planet, thanks for being here. Super thrilled to have you on board. I finished a conversation a little while ago with Derek Furlow Jr. And Derek is one of these guys that just has so much positive energy. He's ex- he's just a, a great guy, a funny guy, a nice guy. And near and dear to my heart, he works with athletes and really helps them take that next step away from the sport and into whatever they're doing now. And uh, he was a former uh, athlete himself, certainly uh, comes from experience. So great guy, super episode. We cover tons of ground, lots of great advice. You're really going to want to listen to this. But before you jump in, please make sure to hit subscribe on whatever you're listening to, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're listening to this, click on that subscribe button. Also go to markmoyer.com anytime to listen to all my prior episodes. They've all been great. Super guests. We're now at 41 and counting. And also get content like how to really take your business and your career to a whole new level. It's all there. Go to it, markmoyer.com. But first of all, take a listen to this episode. Derek's a great guy. You're going to love it. Tons of energy, lots of great advice that you can really use. Happy listening. Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. I am Mark Moyer, and I'm super thrilled to have Derek Furlow Jr. joining me from, where are you now, Derek? Knoxville, Tennessee, on Rocky Top, baby. I don't want to, I'll say one word about Tennessee. Boo! But don't worry, don't worry. Okay. I think you know why I'm doing that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But anyway, I'm super thrilled to have you on board, Derek. It's, um, you know, we were just joking a few minutes ago about what it's like to have a podcast and run it and helping athletes and all kinds of things. Um, um, what I like about you, Derek, is you share a lot of the same, the same passion and the same sort of interest in really helping athletes make a transition and really working with them. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to cover a ton of ground, but before we do that, I want to hear a little bit about um, really where were you sort of born and raised and what, what had you, uh, what steered you towards sports and which sports in particular? Man, I'm originally from Southwest Atlanta, um, so I was raised by a single mom with three kids in the inner city of Atlanta, and growing up, it was drug dealers on every corner, violence all around us, and mm-hmm. police sirens up and down the street every other minute, and I remember being little, and that fear every time I heard a siren or ambulance was, I hope they're not going to my house, so that was my environment at a younger age, and at that point, in life, we moved around a lot. My mom, when I look back at it, was moving around to keep us from, to put us in the best, the best situation possible for our life. And so by the time I was in, in, in elementary school, by the time I got like what, fourth, fifth grade, I had went to four different schools, three different schools. Wow. So we, we found ourselves constantly on the move. And as we got a little bit older, my mom finally moved out of the city of Atlanta and she moved down to, um, Griffin, Georgia, where she met, which is her husband, what is her husband today. And things kind of turned for the better to a degree, um, just because Griffin wasn't um, as big and as populated as Atlanta. However, things wasn't necessarily um, ideal, ideal, but it was definitely a better situation because my mom had help and she was married. And um, Miss Leonard, her husband, was definitely in a way better situation than we were. So I've seen things turn for the positive. However, at that point, I had never really played organized sports because I – couldn't afford it. And I finally had a chance to play one year recreationally and then play it in middle school. And honestly, I, I really was just playing just because I had never really played and I, I didn't really 
it was no, there was no grand adios dream at that particular time. However, by the time I got to high school and we hadn't moved, and I finally had made some friends and we hadn't moved and I had to go make new friends. I started to kind of come out of my shell into my own. and was like, you know what? Um, I can be more, do more, have more. Um, and it can be in my control. Cause prior to that, I thought it was always in my mom's control for us, her to put us in the best situation possible. So me being upset, disappointed, mad, angry, discouraged about my life in that situation, I never really took control or, or did anything about it. I was just kind of there. Um, and I finally had this little, aha moment that super, I can't keep, keep him waiting on Batman and Superman and Robin to come save my life because nothing would change by it and change because all, all I knew my mom was doing the best thing possible to put us in the best situation possible. So when I got to high school, um, I seen a lot, I had a lot of guys around me that was way more talented than me um, in, in sports across the board. But for some strange reason, a lot of them ended up getting kicked out of school, going to jail, whether it was from selling drugs, whether it was from drinking alcohol, whether it was from being in gangs, a lot of those things went on around me. And I seen guys that were bigger than me, stronger than me, faster than me, kind of get took off the playing field and out, and out of high school. So at that moment, it was kind of one of those things that it detoured me from that particular route. And from the other perspective, growing up, the only way to improve your situation outside of selling drugs and knowing what they were doing was to be a rapper or play sports. So... I seen that route they took, it didn't make sense to me because it took away their freedom and it didn't let them change the situation. So it left rapping and playing sports. So I tried rapping for a little while. And um, at that point in time, they had a little bow wow. And um, I guess so, so Dev didn't need me because they had never responded to my letters that I wrote them. <laughs> or, or, or any of my mix tapes. Um, so at that moment, um, I figured I'd get a sports thing to run. And man, I played basketball, track, and football. And that was my freshman year. And I played all, all three of those sports. And I wasn't really sure which one I was the best at or anything like that, but I just played all sports and the coaches said I was pretty good at them. So going into my sophomore year of high school, I knew that sports could be my way to improve my life and change my situation. And at that moment, my stepdad got a job promotion and it came with a raise. However, that job promotion also came with a move. Uh -huh. uh, that move would move us from Griffin, Georgia to across Arkansas. And Mark, I'm not sure about you, but if, have you ever been to Arkansas? No. Yeah, you've been lucky, bro. You're, you're lucky. <laughs> it, it, it was nothing there for me. Um, so when we get to Arkansas, um, we're in a place that's the home of Walmart, and this place didn't even have a super Walmart at the time. Now, I'm sure they do now. Um, but we get there, and we had, I think, two red lights, some stop signs, stuff like that. It, 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 it was culture shock. And at that moment, I knew... I wasn't happy. I was, I, I, the situation like it got worse. So it was like, okay, I got to take control of my own life. And that's when I came up with this plan. It was called the get out of Arkansas plan. And um, at that moment, it was going to have to be sports. It was going to get me out of Arkansas because selling drugs wasn't going to do it. Rapping, Arkansas was so behind in music. I know I ain't stand a chance of making it. <laughs> I knew that wasn't going to happen. So at this point, it's like, all right, you got to play sports. Yeah. And I didn't know what sport I was going to play. So I get there, I start playing football. We had a, a, a okay sophomore year. However, I was still mad and angry that we were still there. Um, I, I played basketball during the basketball season. We go home during, during Christmas break to Atlanta. We come back. Coach said, hey, you missed some basketball games and you missed practice, so you got to run 500 bleachers to get back on the team. And at that point, Mark, I told him I didn't like basketball that much. So that was my last time playing organized basketball in my life. And then that just left me with track. And quite frankly, I didn't like track because it felt like punishment. So – this narrowed it down to football. They had to be my get out of Arkansas plan. So I looked at football. I said, like, okay, who, who, who's done what I'm looking to do? I need to give me a full ride scholarship back to U University of Georgia. Um, that's going to help me get out of here for one. And it's going to help me pay for school. And it's going to help me put, my, put myself in a position that I can go and go to the NFL to take care of my family. So that was the idea. And I, but at that point in time, they had a guy by the name of Darren McFadden who was a sophomore who was already committed to the University of Arkansas. And I looked at what he did, and I pretty much just said, okay, I'm going to duplicate what he did to get that full-ride scholarship as a sophomore. And uh, my goal was to rush for 2,200 yards, 20 touchdowns, take school to the first state championship, got to put the school on the map, the city on the map, and get me some attention, and get me a full-ride scholarship at the UGA, and I'll be out of there, and my life will be happily ever after. And um, that was kind of what started um, this journey to where I am now, because, you know, you got these ideas, but a lot of stuff don't go your way. And, my plan, my get out of Arkansas plan, um, it, it, some things happened that made life what it is today, um, I guess, good. Some some bad things happened that, 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 that changed. So 
I'm curious if you probably can ask me what happened. Not yet. I, I'm still um, hanging out with that whole get out of Arkansas thing. I think that's absolutely hilarious. I, of course, no, uh, no offense to all my listeners in Arkansas. Um, you know who you are. There's three of you or something. Um, but, um, but I, I totally, uh, you know, I, I, I hear what you, what you, what you went through at the time because, and it's funny when you tell me the story about how you narrowed down from the three sports into one, because, you know, I think a lot, a lot of times it doesn't matter what sports you're playing when you play them, you're convinced that you're a pretty damn good athlete. And you kind of think, well, you know what? I can be, just bring it on, man. You know what? You want me to play water polo? I'm in the pool. You know, I'll do it. And you're like, wait a minute, I don't know how to swim. But right. uh, if I knew how to swim, I'd be at, yeah, I'd be, I'd be amazing. So, you know, uh, I like, <laughs> I love what you said about the track thing where I, you know, <laughs> it just felt like punishment. I think because so. <laughs> I hate saying this for everybody out there doing tracks. Sorry, I'm saying this, but you know, when people say, oh yeah, you know, I, I run the, uh, you know, the 800 meter, the whatever. I'm like you know, wouldn't it be just easier to drive? Like, do you need to, why don't you need to run? Like, just go. Like, it, I, I'm not a big fan of like individual things. I, I don't know. I, I like team sports and, or if like I had to play golf, I, it's fun because you can go into the woods and look for your ball and stuff. But, um, but I think it's great how you narrowed it down to football. So yes. Okay, fine. I'll ask the question. <laughs> what, so what happened? Let's, let, let's hear the rest of it. Go That's ahead. The best and the worst thing never happened to me yeah. happened. So, um, Go into my uh, my junior year, and I got this get out of Arkansas plan now. So now I'm, I'm I'm locked in, I'm focused. I know this is going to let me control my life, control my happiness, and control my freedom, and put my family in a better situation. And sure enough, we had a, a good solid team, a, a good solid core of guys that came together. And for the first time um, in the school history, we start off the season five and zero. So we start off this thing five and zero. Next thing you know, we look up six and zero. We look up with seven and zero. We look up. We're eight and zero. We look up. We're nine and zero. We're one game away from going undefeated for the for the regular season, first time in school history. We get to ten and zero. At this point in time, I'm like, okay, this get out of Arkansas plan is coming together. We're winning games. All of a sudden, people around the city and the state are starting to get starting to know that this team is on the map. So all of a sudden, you start getting some some letters in the mail of of interest from different schools. So I'm like, the get out of Arkansas plan is still not complete because. We still got this winning state championship. That's going to solidify to get out of Arkansas playing, right? But I still hadn't got some numbers I needed to get to. So we get them, we go to the first game. Um, we had win. It was a spread team. It was a pretty solid game. Um, it was tough. But we ended up getting the, getting the W. And that's when we look up, we're 11 and 0. So now we're two games away from this get out of Arkansas playing coming to fruition. Two playoff games left in the state championship. So get to the second game of the playoffs, second round, playing Morton. We get the W. So now we got one game away from the state championship. I'm like, I had never had a plan in my life. And all of a sudden I come up with one plan and this thing is working. So you can imagine how excited I am, how I'm feeling, like the ego, all these things being a young athlete in high school, right? We get to this team called Valonia and we're up in like North Central, Midwest, Arkansas, wherever we're at, in the middle of nowhere. And um, we get off the bus, man, and the field looked like a cow pasture and it was wet like it had been raining for like 40 days. And man, we could not run for nothing. Every time we turned, we played. Ta- like, it was pretty much they was on the field, we was on the field, and we was tackling ourselves because we couldn't turn to run. That game was seven to zero all the way into the third quarter. We finally scored seven to seven. They finally scored two more times. We ended up losing that game twenty one seven. They get out of Arkansas playing, came down crashing and burning. I was mad. I was angry. I was frustrated. However, we didn't win the state championship. That team went on to go win it all, and. We, that season ended, and I felt like I was defeated. However, I did get some start getting letters in the mail and some attention. But going into that off season, I knew what we needed to do, what we needed to hone in on. I knew the adjustments we needed to make, and I knew we were so close. Would it be my first time ever having a plan? So I said, I was gonna go even harder. I was locked in. Everything I was focused on was get bigger, stronger, faster. I went to about seven different camps, um, places was like. This, wait, was this your? Um Junior and senior year between so, junior, my junior and senior year. So now yeah. we're going into the, the summer of my, um, going into my senior year. Okay. With seven, seven to nine different camps, places like UGA, Ole Miss. Um, and I took my last visit. They called. I was actually working out one day, and there was a call from the University of Arkansas. Coach Houston Nutt said, hey, we want all the guys, the top guys in the state to come up on a visit. Um, I really wasn't going to go because I know I wasn't going to that school. However, yeah. 
um, the exposure and to get a chance to get around different people is why I went. And I'm up there and I'm doing these ball drills and as I'm doing the last ball drill, I come down kind of funny and don't really think nothing of it um, just because I was able to finish the rest of the camp and nothing really had happened when I, how I came down. But on that drive home, my knee swells up and um, it was swollen up larger than normal and come to find out I had tore my meniscus. So I finally go to the doctor. At first I was a little nervous about it, but I finally get to the doctor and they said, hey, meniscus tear to put you out two to three weeks, no biggie. So coach said, hey, get your scope. You'll miss the first non-conference games by the time the season starts. We'll come back, bring you back to a conference. We'll go ahead and finish this thing on up, take care of business. Well, where we was at, we had to drive to Louisiana to have surgery. So we drive to Louisiana, um, we go down there to have surgery. And I remember waking up as they wheeling me out of the operating room and I had this, I felt like this brace on my left leg as I'm kind of still foggy. And I remember touching that brace and when I touched the brace, the doctor, doctor was to the right of me. I kind of kind of rolled over and was like, hey, doc, what's this brace on my leg? And I remember him saying these words that changed my life forever. He said, oh, that brace, that brace is for your ACL. And all of a sudden I came to, I said, what do you mean my ACL? It wasn't torn. I come clear, wake up saying, mama, my mom comes rushing in. The doctor's standing right there like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And I said, mom, mom, you repaired my ACL, you repaired my ACL. And it wasn't even broke, it wasn't even tore, it wasn't even tore. He said, well, come to find out, it was a slight tear in it. And if I wouldn't have repaired it, it would have been considered malpractice. So at that moment, I became obsolete on a football landscape, taking away my dreams, my goals, everything that I had been working for, taking away the opportunity for me to create my own life, taking away the opportunity for me to create my freedom. And that get out of Arkansas plan would never come to fruition because everything I had worked for was just took away from me because I didn't have the stage and the vehicle that was gonna allow me to do it, which was football. And all I can remember was riding home, crying, asking, why me, why me? And for the first couple of weeks, the coach didn't tell the rest of the team that I was going to be out um, just because he didn't want to mess up morale. They had started off pretty good. And they finally told him that I wasn't coming back. And you see the morale kind of adjust. And at that moment, all I could do was rehab. I had this idea in my head of the Cinderella story, me healing and coming back before the season went in. And I was working out rehabbing three times a day. And I remember one day just sitting on the bed, crying, doing a rehab, using this, this machine to see can I get my bent, um, get the, um, the, the angle back of bending my knee. And I remember saying, why me, why me? And I heard this voice say to me, I gave you that football stage for the glorification of my kingdom and you was using that stage for your own purpose, your own selfish reasons and your own personal selfish ambitions. So I gave you that stage, I had to take it away from you to get your attention. And um, at that moment, my, my life changed forever because it gave me a different perspective. I, I wasn't really sure what to do, but I still had hope that something was gonna work out for me, even though everything was seen doom and gloom. So all I did was continue to rehab. And sure enough, man, season ends, the team and I'm going five and five, don't even make the playoffs. Um, and I'm, I'm back running track just because I hate running, but my knee is messed up, now I'm trying to recover. Right. So now I'm trying to see how fast I can make myself get back to see what can happen by, before I graduate. And sure enough, um, spring ball comes around right at, right at the end of track. And I get this letter in the mail from the University of Tennessee, a place I never visited, never watched, and they was inviting me to come to the spring game. And at this point in time, it was smaller schools that had been sending me information before I got hurt. I had told them, no, I wasn't coming because I wanted to go to UGA. I was going to D1. I was going back to Georgia. Other schools that wasn't in Georgia, guess what? I had pretty much put them on the back burner because guess what? I was going to Georgia. So I had burned all these bridges and come to find out when I got hurt, me and Georgia stopped talking. Coach Rucker that was recruiting me, he left me with the Texas. So now I have zero options. So I went from having options with this guy to Arkansas playing to having no options. And then all of a sudden, the University of Tennessee sends this letter in the mail. So that was one of the best, worst things that ever happened to me because I had a chance to visit the University of Tennessee um, on a whim. And it happened to have, to, how it happened, I, met, I had a chance to go visit them when I was playing in the spring game, go visit the coaches. And when I walked into the office, they said, hey, um, we actually saw you on film uh, uh, playing against two guys that was already committed to coming here. We know your story. We know you're hurt. And we can't give you a full ride right now because we're not sure how your knees are going to recover. However, if your knee responds, how it's capable of responding and you play to your full capabilities, we've got a full ride scholarship waiting on you. And at that moment, I said, sign me up. Wow. That's what happened. That's amazing. Now, I'm curious about something. So what... Um, when you had the surgery, was when you said the doctor sort of said he was required to do it because uh, you know malpractice, or whatever. But you know, do you feel that 
if you didn't have that surgery, would it have torn at some point or is it something that it, it would have healed itself? What would have happened um, if he hadn't done that? I, I don't know. However, I had, had a teammate that had ACL surgery before, um, that tore his ACL before and he said it hurt. So at this point in my life, I said, man, look, if my ACL is torn, let me know it's torn. Like, let me find out during the game and let me be hurt. Because guess what? If it had been torn this whole time, I still went to all these camps that summer and, and did great at those camps. So I'm not sure how long it had been torn. As far as I was concerned, I was still able to, to play. So right, right. I feel like he took the ball out of my hands. And yeah, exactly. I'm sure that's how you felt, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he. I'd be thinking the same thing. Like, you know, who the hell are you? I mean, I'm drugged, I'm passed out, and you're deciding my future, basically, right? right? That's but, exactly what you're but you know what, as you said earlier, though, you know, a lot of times what we think at first are uh, things that just didn't go our way, really change things and really steer us a completely way, you know, a way we never imagined. And, um, you know, I've been through a lot of those as well. It's in, And, you know, you kind of have to <clears throat> always kind of keep the faith that that um, there is a method to all that madness that's going on. And, and you know, it's it's going to all work out in the end. Right. That's um, so. So you show up in Tennessee and you're like, holy cow, everything's orange. What the hell? Um, and tell me, uh, tell me what that was like to go to, to go to, I mean, it's a big school. That's, it's, it's well-known. It's, it's got a great reputation. You show up and how does that, what's that experience like? Man, it was, it was an incredible experience. The crazy part about it is I just so happened to be coming in with the number one recruiting class in the country. So the attention was on the guys coming in. I'm coming in with these guys. So I feel like I still had something to prove now because I'm like, this is not how I expected my route to get here. Like, I didn't even, like, this is not the road I thought I was going to take. Right. Like, it was a lot of those undefined things that I had to go redefine about myself because I hadn't played the game in a year. My knee, I hadn't played on my knee. Now I'm coming in with number one recruiting class. Everybody knows every guy coming in. It's, the stadium sits 107,000 people. So the concept of me, I got to go prove this not only to myself, but to the coaches and to the players that are coming in. That, hey, that's supposed to be on this platform playing with you guys. So the, um, the chip on my shoulder, to say the least, in the, in the, in the relentless pursuit to, to yeah. prove that I belonged here was definitely um, the, 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 the thought process and the mindset that I had just because it didn't work out. I didn't have the easy route. And a lot of guys were highly recruited. They had <laughs> Out and it worked out really simple for them, and I had a chance to be around them. So the um, appreciation for the game, the appreciation for being able to chance to do it, it mine was different just because I, I I knew what it was going to take for me to get to that point. I had to do what I was expected to do and exceed it, not just do what I was expected to do just because I was already there on scholarship um, like those guys were. So it was yeah. um it was definitely different, man. It was definitely um, – But it must it, have been like uh... – you know, because I think back to when I first went to college and I was like, wow, like, look at all these buildings and I can, I mean, I'm alone here now and I can kind of, it, it's like, you know, I was out from under the umbrella, right? You're, you're sort of now in a, a whole new place and you're, you're independent, you're on your own. It's, it's like, and, you know, some people take that freedom and that, um, you know, independence and they run with it the wrong way. And then others yeah. it the right way, right? But, you know, as a student athlete, though, Derek, you know, now, I mean, you're obviously joining a very, uh, you know, a, a top football program, but you're also, you know, you've got to focus at some point on academics, right? And then there's also time that you need to be basically a kid. Like, you need to be, you know, have a little bit of a social life, whether it's, you know, dating or just hanging out with the buddies or whatever it is. But, you know, college presents three sort of type of serious commitments with it, with the sports, the academics and, and social and Definitely social. Yes. And, and, and it's, how do you, you know, and what I think a lot of student athletes really struggle with is, well, they don't necessarily have time for all three. So they oftentimes have to give up like half of one of them, right. Or, or oh. most of one. And a lot of them, unfortunately, they, they bail on academics because they're having a whole lot of fun socially and they they're focused on their sport others kind of mail it in on the sports because they need to focus on the other two and so on yeah. but what was your experience like while you're at tennessee so so my experience was a little different because I, I feel like i was still on a mission like i still had work to get done so mine both first and foremost had to be academically to stay in there and then two 
Um, cause, cause I had got some academic money. I did kind of work some stuff out cause I did have solid grades coming out of high school. So I got some academic support and so I got my full ride. So I earned it. Then I had to prove myself on the football field. So the social part was still a little weird to me just cause in my environmental setting coming from Atlanta to Arkansas, they helped me be, get a little more diverse and, and, and understand people. Cause when I got to Knoxville, the, the percentage of minorities was like, if, if one or 2%. So really, really? Another, wow. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it maxed to the set right now is like six percent. So wow. it's still it's still a um <laughs> yeah not very um cultural no environment at all. So that was number three on the list. My, but my priorities was in order. Now some of my teammates I came in, they don't have nothing to prove, no chip on their shoulder. They highly recruited, highly touted. They can have fun. And coach is gonna play them, coach is gonna give them that benefit of the doubt because they already don't recruit them, that's their guy. So from that perspective, I saw that I still had the chip on my shoulder. So I, I was locked in on a mission that had stuff to prove. Some of my other guys that was on a mission that had stuff to prove. Our first meeting, Coach Trooper Taylor looked at us and said, look to your right, look to your left. There's 26 guys in this room. He said, half of y'all won't be here when the summer graduate. Guess how many people graduate? 13. No kidding. Wow. So I probably would have been part of 13 that didn't graduate if I would have had the easy road, if the scholarship yeah, would have came. Right, right. Had a great year. So the, what happened to me earlier, that that mess, that that change, of course, made me appreciate, made me responsible. It made me realize this thing can be took from you any minute. But at the end of the day, it made me focus on something that was bigger than me. Because at the end of the day, I had to come back and, and, and earn, I had to. But my only purpose at that time, I got to get the scholarship. I can't be doing this long stuff. I, I, I know I got a mission, and the only way I'm going to get a chance to, to play how I need to play is to be on scholarship where I can not be careful, not be thinking about uh, a loan. I've been thinking about the, my fa- the financial strain I'm going to put on my family. So I had to handle business. So it made my approach to college a whole lot different than some of those guys I came in with, which was a lot of them was a detriment to a lot of those guys because they had a chance to focus on more fun. Um, right. And then got them in the back you know what, Derek? Though is that, and you know, I, I feel this all the time that that when you when you work really hard and you earn something, there's just so much more satisfaction from achieving whatever you're achieving. And and I promise you that those people that got the full ride, but they got the you know the easy the easy route, and they didn't have to work that hard. They didn't. They probably didn't feel any. They had an emptiness in them a little bit, right? And you busted your ass, and like you said, you played with a chip. You you know acted with a chip, and doesn't when you have a chip on your shoulder doesn't necessarily mean it's a a negative. It's a bad thing. It's something. It's a driving force, right? When you've got that driving force, it you become much more unstoppable. And 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 I'm and I'm, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but it's really gotten you to where you are today because it's really it's instilled in you that drive that drive to not just succeed but to be you know, adding value to be something better than average, right? And I think that's fabulous. So, so shifting a little bit now. So, you know, what what got to your point where you're now r- wrapping up at Tennessee? What what are you seeing going forward? What's what's next for you? So at that point, I seen. A, so I earned my scholarship, and at that right. point, um, the pressure was leave. However, I seen a lot of guys that had graduated, left, went to the league, or left early, the league didn't work out. And I seen them coming back to school. I seen guys that left early and had pretty much not taken any classes that counted towards a major. And I seen guys that transitioned, that put in work in the, in the weight room, work on the field, but was struggling in life. So I'm seeing this. So in my head, I'm like, this happening to so many guys, whether I know them personally, or they play with me, or they're on other teams. If I don't do something about it, I'm gonna be on that same crash course they're on. So at this point, I'm starting to be aware, playing safety, I, I was taught to be aware of what's going on around me. Growing up in the inner city of Atlanta, I was taught to be aware of what's going on around me. Right. The best situation before it ha- happens. So as I'm watching, I'm like, how are these guys not transitioning the right way? How are they struggling? And nothing they're going to do after the game is harder than what they done did right here. This summer workout, these, these camps that we done went through, these, these, these firemen carries, these four hours of working out. And it didn't, I, I couldn't get it. So I would talk back and forth with a good friend of mine, Inky Johnson, and we would go back and forth just throwing out these thoughts of how the game was prepping us for life. We called it life prep. However, a lot of guys didn't know how to take those football skills and correlate them and carry them over into life. They didn't know how to they, – they, they turn off the switch because they, they think the things that they learned on the field were no longer relevant off the court, off the field, off the, off, out the pool. 
So that's when I started to to start kind of get myself out of this athletic bubble because for a year in high school, guess what? I wasn't an athlete. I, my, my first my first identity as an athlete had died. So I had to go a whole year without being an athlete, which was tough. So now when I see these guys take their first year out of life after sports, not being an athlete at, after college, they were dying. So that was the struggle. I had already been there before. So I had that early death it, it resurrected. So now I'm, I'm looking at it from that perspective. I done been there before. I know what they're going through. However, I got a chance to, I done learn from it. What did I learn? How can I apply something right now? And that's when the ball and the wheels start to start to turn. Okay, how can I use what the game is teaching me right now and make it relevant when I'm no longer playing? How can I use the stage and playing in front of 107,000 people and make it relevant if I don't go to the league? And that's kind of what started happening, man. And, um, it kind of, I seen a, a test of it when I started an online company um, and when I was still playing in the summertime with a nutraceutical, a, a plant-based product that helped my knee. When I seen people use it just because I was an athlete and they, they wanted to use it just because I was using it, that's when the light bulb kind of went off. And that's when I said, we got a brand, we got a stage, we got something we can use and then we just never really tapped into it. It never been, no one ever, there's not a class or a course or a book you can read to show you how to use that brand and that stage on whatever level you are as an athlete, because you got influence. And that's that's honestly what started the ball rolling um, and the thought process that triggered. But fortunately, the injury in high school and that first death and me having to live a life for a year without being an athlete and not being able to identify just because I could not play and couldn't suit up made me have to take a step back and identify myself as something bigger than just an athlete. And I've seen a lot of guys never got a chance to do it until – they were in real life and they never thought about it, sat down and tried to figure out how can they use that, that stage. Well, that's, that's perfect that you say that, Derek, because, you know, um, the majority of the athletes that I speak to really didn't do, you, just what you said, they, they didn't prepare ever for what happens the, the day they leave the game. And so many athletic careers are cut short because of injury or just simply um, not, you know, not being good enough anymore. And the thing is, when you're an athlete, you you have such tremendous pride in your skill and you are convinced that you're still really good. And it's just so tough to acknowledge that the end is coming. And so therefore, most most athletes almost feel that if they prepare for life after the sport, it's going to happen sooner than if they don't. That's like a mentality where they're thinking, you know what, if I start learning how to be an accountant or uh, or whatever, I'm going to be an accountant sooner than I want to be. So maybe I should just wait. I'm going to keep waiting from that. Right. And then like, you know, with any, almost anything you, you can't, it's almost like, uh, you know, preparing for a test as you walk into the test, you can't do that. You can't. So, you know, I think part of, and I know we're on the same page with all this, but you know, it's, it's so essential to start preparing before something happens before the moment hits. Right. And, um, but I don't want to talk too much about it. I'll let you do that. But, but. So, so Mark, you, you, you just said something, and and this is what the athlete, the athlete can change their perspective on this. I think it'll help them out tremendously. What I decided to do was not compare or not think about, okay, what's going to happen once the game is over? I started thinking about, okay, what skills am I learning right now that I can use? So now it's like, okay, me studying film, breaking down film, doing this role playing, that's going to be a relevant tool that's going to allow me to get into sales to learn how to read a script, break it down the script, or role play. Like, I started correlating how those things that the game was teaching me were going to be relevant, not that, okay, I'm going to, if I want to be an accountant, I got to start focusing on this right now, and that's going to let me take less off the sports. Not that, they got, they got to stop making this, this sep- like it's two separate lives. If you understand, look, this is the line you're going, this line that you're in right now is adding value to you, making you bigger, stronger, faster, just like being in the weight room for you to use it over here, but continue to do this and be the biggest, strongest, fastest you can be at this, but just know all those muscles that you're building, all those tools that you're adding are still going to be relevant once you cross this line, once you get over here, and that's the, the mindset that they have versus thinking, if I start thinking about this, it's going to take away from what I'm doing, and I don't want to think about it because it's going to make me think I'm, I'm giving up or I'm, or I'm calling it quits or I'm doing it too short. That's, not the, that's the wrong process. That right there will hurt you every single time. You know what's funny? I just I just thought of something. I, I got to start remembering all these things I think about because I um, this one might be a decent one. But you know, when you're an athlete um, and you're training for a sport, whatever the sport is, and you're in the let's say the the gym and you're working out, and a lot of times the trainers will want you to really activate every muscle as possible. You know, like 
muscles you don't use uh, too often, but start act right. And it's the same sort of thing with your with your brain, where you know while you're playing and you're you're a student athlete, you may not necessarily be exercising the uh, certain brain cells that might help you be that accountant or whatever it is. But what's interesting is if you start exercising those brain uh, cells, they can actually help you with your sport too. I right. mean that you'll be a more logical player. So, you know, um, especially now with all the analytics that are happening in all the sports, you know, people on the teams are looking at the players that are not just physically gifted, but they're also mentally gifted because they, they can, I mean, look, a guy like Tom Brady, for example, you know, um, I detest the Patriots. Let's just put it out there, but I have all the respect in the world for this guy because he, I mean, you know, he's like Greg Maddox was as a pitcher, being a Braves fan. I mean, you know, you're smart. When you're smart and you know what you're doing, you don't need to be the most gifted guy athletically. You know, I'm a really, really bad hockey player, pretty bad, but I know the game really well. So I kind of know where I need to be and know what I should be doing. And I score goals, not because I know what the hell I'm, I mean, I am a great shooter, but I just, I'm, I use the, a few brain cells that I got left. So... Yeah. It's uh, it's just that thing. That's that's perfect. So, so walk me through what what made you like what, you know. So now you're starting to do this at, while you're still a student there, but, you know, you graduate. Well, I mean, what what made you decide? Well, what am I going to do next, right? So 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 my first, it, what what happened for me is I I, I hurt my shoulder doing the pro day. I had already heard it during the season. I heard it during the pro day. They said, hey, you got to have shoulder surgery. I had been down that route before with my knee. I didn't want to have shoulder surgery because I understand that leads to you having six months recovery, six months rehab, and you're, you're chasing this dream and you're putting off life. And I realized while well, I had been here in my four years, I had learned some intangible things from the game. So I'm like, okay, you know what? My first life after sport experience, I'm finna go out here and, and, and get a job so I can make some money. So I was doing these football camps around the country. Um, then all of a sudden the football camps come to the end and I come to this point where I'm like, I guess I gotta get a real job. Well. The only thing that crossed my mind from when I started that business in 07 till now, I graduated in 2009, 2010, and I'm out here doing these football camps was, I have to put myself in position that I can create um, and, and, and put my family in position to win and I can control my life and my happiness. So the only thing I had saw was sales or entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I had some friends that I had met that, that knew football players that, that watched the game that had an opportunity, a sales opportunity. So guess what? My network from me playing sports landed me a, a sales opportunities with this, with this big vacation ownership company, right? So at this point, I get into sales, and my first year, I'm getting my, my tail whipped. I'm up here trying to sell vacation ownership to families on vacation, and I got two hours to talk to them, and they were bribed to come in and talk to me, and I got to sell them a package that's so minimum 20 grand, maximum probably about 90 grand. And it's not working out. <laughs> so at this point, I sit down and ask myself, what made me elite in sports? What did I do that made me one of the best of the best in sports? And I sat down and thought about how we either learn our playbook or how we study film on an, on an opponent. And we had this process that we went through. And this, I call this the learning formula. We would first and foremost, we would read, the, um, read, this, read, read, read our playbook. Let's say we're gonna learn our, learn our own stuff. We're gonna read the playbook. After we read the playbook, we're gonna watch film on some of the plays. So now we watch film, we're gonna see it. We're gonna go to practice. We're gonna give ourselves all the different scenarios and we're gonna practice it. But while we're practicing it, it's gonna be recorded. Well, after practice, the next day, we're gonna go back and watch the film that we just practiced. Well, while we're watching the film, we're gonna make adjustments and corrections. And then guess what we're gonna do the day after that? We're gonna go back and practice again. So at this point in time, we doing this four days out of the week. By the time it came down for game day, we know the adjustments, the checks, the alignments, the assignments, the keys, the tendencies. We became such a student of the game for our plays and what we're going to get and what we're looking to do in our, in, in our call sheet, what we're going to be executing. The game was easy. So when I got into sales, guess what I started doing? I, I had to learn the sales system, the sales process, the script, of rebuttals, objections. I had to be good with the people. I mean, I had to build, build rapport. So guess what I did? I started going over the script and I would role play with somebody that worked at the office with me. Well, we were recorded. So when I recorded, I can go back and listen to it or hear it, see how they responded. Did they respond how I wanted them to or not? What were their objections? 
Why did they say what they said? What did I say? How did I respond? What was the body language? And then the next day, we role play again. So now I know how to make my, object, my, my corrections, my adjustments on what to say, what not to say, but I can pretty much dictate what they was gonna say and how they was gonna do it. Well, I started doing this on a regular basis, so by the time they got down to me actually having a prospect in front of me, guess what? I became pretty good at selling them something and figuring out why they was gonna buy it or why they wouldn't go buy it, and I could duplicate it. And sure enough, my sales started to go up, go up, my team sales started to go up, go up, and this thing became real easy. So at that point, I went from a sales rep to end up being one of the company's presenter for the whole company, for everybody that walked into the building. But at that moment, that's when I realized, if I was able to take that from the game, all I had to do was figure out what did, I, what did the game teach me versus what I gave the game. Because you see a lot of athletes think about what they gave the game. I gave the game right. my blood, my sweat, my tears. I gave right. it 15 years of the game, commitment. I gave it time. All right, you're thinking all that. Great, great, you did all that. What did the game give you back? It gave you confidence. It gave you resiliency. It gave you the way to control your emotions after a big win or a big loss. It, it, it gave you dedication. It gave you commitment. It gave you a lot of things, which think about it. So you had to tap into what the game gave you. So I thought about what the game gave me as far as learning and preparation from film study. It showed me how to prepare. And a lot of people can win, but it's the people that prepare to win that are the champions. So it taught me how to prepare. So guess what I started doing? I started preparing just like it was game day. So on game day, I was practicing. I was performing on game day and executing versus practicing on a potential customer. And literally, that's when it changed. And that's when the aha moment went off. I said, if I can take those things from the game and apply them over here in sales, what else can I take away from the game that I can apply my life and business? And if I'm doing it, how many guys I know are doing it, which my buddy Inky Johnson was, and then how many guys I know are not doing it, and this is probably why they're suffering. And that's when it all resonated. There you go. So shifting gears now, that was uh, you know about eight, nine years ago, right? Now, so now I, you know, I go onto your website. I love the website, it's great. It's um because you know, you can there's a lot on there. There's a lot to absorb, but you've got, uh, I mean, this is going to sound, I'm not usually like the sappy kind of guy. All right. So I just want to, I want everybody to know I'm not usually like this, but hope, man. I mean, you talk a lot. I mean, there's a lot of hope on here. I mean, on the site. And what I mean by that is that, you know, anybody that's going through any sort of struggles, you can, you can really help them out. But tell me a little bit about what it is you're, you know, what it is you're doing with, you know, you, your business. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, the website is, is Derek I mean, thank God there weren't other Derek furloughs out there to take that, uh, I know, know. right. <laughs> Cause there were, there was a Mark Moyer out there that had my website Duh! and I had to pay him. Duh! But anyway, um, who the hell knew there was another Mark Moyer out there? anyway. Um, but and tell me a little bit now, I mean, Derek now, I mean, things have obviously shifted quite a bit, but walk me through now what it is you, you, do what you love doing and what, you know, if, if someone said to you, you know, Hey Derek, we're going to give you X, whatever, a million dollars, whatever the amount is for you to do this, what would it be? So what, what, what I do right now, um, is I share hope via my story and via that story is speaking in a lot of the sports principles that I learned and how I was able to take those takeaways from those principles and then figure out how can they correlate well, they was in life and the business and then carry those things over to life and the business to get the same success that I had in sports. So right now, whether I'm speaking to athletes, where I'm speaking to seniors transitioning out of college, where I'm speaking to companies that just merged in their transition, where I'm speaking to sales team, sales teams that's looking to, 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 to put a, the, 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 or new hires, whatever that looks like. I, I feel that the perspective that I've learned from the game and the things that it has taught me you got people that play sports, you got people that watch sports. I believe that sports is a direct correlation to life and it gives you the chance to see it in a controlled environment. And if you can watch it, whether you're watching it for three hours out of your day or you're playing it, you can take some things away from the game, from these elite athletes that people look up to, that people admire, that people worship. You can take some things from them and apply it directly to your life and your business and achieve the same type of elite level status in your life and in your business. However, you're not looking at it from the proper perspective. So when it comes down to me, the tools and, and, and the products on the website, it's practical, applicable principles that the game has taught me that can be used for athletes transitioning, for people transitioning every single day, whether it's for careers, whether it's from divorces. We always are in transition. However, a lot of times in the middle of our mess, we miss the message. So all I took from sports was 
I was able to decode the mess, the message out of middle of all my messes. And now I'm putting it to him on, serving it to him on a silver platter. Like, okay, you're probably going to go through this mess at some point in time. It might not look exactly like mine, but you can probably reflect on a mess you done went through. What was the message in the middle of your mess that you can take and go apply and use to your advantage in your life or your business? And me, Personally, I feel like I get a chance to deliver hope, whether it's me speaking to them, whether it's me reading the book, whether it's me um, having my online transition training program, whatever my tools are, I feel like I just get a chance to help decode it, simplify it, and help people decode their own message in the middle of their mess and show them how they can take that thing from one phase and use it in the next phase of their life, um, whether it's in business, to get their unfair advantage. And sports just kind of gave it to me from a sports perspective, but at the end of the day, we're all humans. So I'm, I'm talking to it from an athletic perspective because those are my peers and that's a big void that needs to be filled because there's never been a class you can take or a course you can, you can take or a book you can read. And to us, however, we're still human beings at the end of the day. So the correlation applies. Um, it's pretty much just a, 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 a sports self-help book to a degree, a sports self-help platform, a sports self-help whatever you want to call it, that can be applied in sports life and business. So that's what I do. If somebody want to pay me a lot of money to do it, I know I'll do a good job at it. <laughs> oh, well, there's no doubt there. And look, I think that the, um, the big message and, and this one that, uh, that, you know, I, I talk about all the time is that, um, you know, when you're an athlete, um, you know, ideally the best time to prepare is while you're still playing. But, you know, we, we uh, honestly, we also see that, the fact that a lot of these men and women, they're in their early 20s, late teens, early 20s, mid 20s. They're at the top of the world. You know, they're, they're some of them are making some nice money or they're very successful in whatever they're doing and playing. And they they're, they feel invincible a little bit and they don't necessarily feel like they need to prepare. And, you know, my feeling, Derek, is that I wish that some of the um, sort of the sports, the governing bodies, whether it's the uh, players associations of the different sports or the, or the, the leagues themselves really make it more acceptable and more accessible, I guess, for, for an athlete to just start doing something even during off season, an hour a day, an hour a week, something where they're getting, you know, uh, some exposure to, you know, I said accounting earlier, maybe not accounting, but renewable energy or, you know, being a paralegal or something where they're gaining something that's, that's exercising another part of their brain. And, and I think that if we're able to somehow start that going, it can just really make that. So, I mean, look, so, and you know, this Derek, there's so many people, so many people come out of their sport and they struggle. They just, it's just tough for them. And they, they used to be way up here. And now they look at someone in a suit and they're intimidated. They're scared. They're like, I can't be that person. I barely know how to tie a tie. I can't do that. And I, I tell people, uh, you know, every day I say to them, look, you bring so many things to the table as an athlete that non-athletes just don't have. Sure. I mean, you said yourself, you were playing football in front of 107,000 people. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you can talk to 99% of people that are professionals in a, in a business, in a working environment. And they won't step on a stage in front of six people, much less 107,000, right? And, you know, so the opportunity to, um, you know, be able to present in front of the media, do, you know, media relations, any sort of PR stuff, business development, um, there's, uh, you know, the, the work ethic is through the roof. The ability to pivot quickly uh, with change, you know, in, in football, I mean, you're tossed a playbook every, like, what? I got to do what? You know, and suddenly right. you're like, I mean, there's so many, the physical demands, the mental demands, there's so many things that make an athlete extraordinarily appealing to a company to want to hire. And a lot of times the athlete just doesn't know that or see that or realize that. And that's, that's what I think, at least that's what one of my missions is really try to educate the athlete as much as possible that they actually bring so much more to the table than they think they do. And it's just a question of awakening that in their minds a little bit. You, you, Mark, you hit it right on the head. The exposure to the other opportunities, the exposure to they can be more, do more, have more outside of the game, the exposure to what the game has done for them. So, for example, if you think about the sports perspective of a game, you get a chance to have a, a controlled setting and you get a chance to practice how you're going to emotionally respond to a major win. 
Imagine, imagine um, the biggest win you ever had. You had a chance to respond accordingly, right? Then all of a sudden, you might have had a terrible loss and you had a chance to respond maybe not so good in sports. Right. Well, all of a sudden, you get into life and somebody gets cancer and you got everybody looking at you to see how you're going to respond because you're the man of the household. You done been emotionally at a high before and emotionally at a low before, so you can respond accordingly until they make it through that situation. Or you get a job and all of a sudden they're failing big time and they're going to close everybody, close it down and everybody's going to get fired and they're looking for you to get them out of the ditch. You done been under pressure before, so you know how to respond. It's some people that's never been put in a situation to practice how they're going to respond, to practice how they're going to apply to respond to pressure, to practice how they're going to respond to the coach yelling at them or how a manager going to yell at them. So they fold, they buckle, they crumble. But you as an athlete, you done been there, done that multiple times, making you technically, depending on how many hours you done did it, you got 10,000 hours of, of responding emotionally, intelligently, or 10,000 hours of making terrible decisions. So you, you, you're going to be really good at something, really bad at something, but you never take the time to think about what the game has technically gave you intangibly and how it, how it can be used in a different setting and make you elite. Because you never have never it never been exposed to the concept, the idea of your true value from the game perspective relevant to a business situation or a life situation. So that's one of the biggest things I want to help them think about. But like you said, if there's so many intangible things that the game have prepared you for, hmm. it's unreal. I mean, it's just unreal. So if athletes can start to shift or we can start to help them realize that on the front end. When they get into this job deal, for example, performing under pressure or coming back in the clutch or making, making crucial situations, decisions, how critical is that in the business world? You've been doing, you've been, you've been doing that. I mean, depending on what position you play, you've been doing that so long, like it's a second nature to you. Absolutely. But of course, it's not talked about, it's not explained, it's not shown, it's, they don't know until somebody like me or you get a chance to sit down with them, they come across some information that changes perspective, changes their thinking, changes their thoughts on it. Yeah, well, look, let's let's make that our mission, man. Let's get everybody uh, on that same brainwave, wavelength, wave yeah. brain, whatever it's called. Um, yeah. Well, look, I could, you know, I mean, we put the two of us in a room. We could talk about this all day long. Um, but one one thing I want to do right now is uh, just quickly ask you if if someone you know wants to reach out to you. What's I mean, you've got your website. What else? Uh, talk to me about your social media. Where else can people reach you? They can find me on any social media platform at Derek Furlow Jr. So that's D-E-R-R-I-C-K-F-U-R-L-O-W Jr. And they can, they can reach out to me with this LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. The handle is the same on all of them. And um, I love to get a chance to connect with them, answer any questions, and just help them transition like a champion. Yes, I love it. Excellent. All right, we're shifting gears. We're going to do my Hit Your Mark uh, little segment here. Super easy-ish. Um, but just a quick couple quick questions that kind of are a little fun. Do you own a boat? No. Terrible investment. <laughs> That's right. The best investment is your friend's boat. <laughs> yes, exactly. I got good friends. It's a true story. There you go. Uh, but if you did have one, what would you name it? That's a great question. <laughs> if I had one, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on probably what kind of boat I had. <laughs> Expensive boat? Any boat. I don't know. Canoe. I don't give it. You know, whatever. If I'm going to have a boat, it, 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 it got to be, um, I, I, I would call it, it, it it'd be epic. That's kind of cool. Um, in fact, you know, it reminds me of, I know this is a, a random aside here, but <clears throat> Don't steal this, by the way. Although if I say it on the podcast, I guess everyone can hear it. But um, one of the things I always like to say, because I, you know, sometimes I get frustrated because I give lots of, I give tons of advice. I always say it's great advice, right? But then at the end of the day, sometimes I don't listen to my own advice sometimes. And I, you know, and so I always like to say a great t-shirt would be, please take my advice. I'm not using it. <laughs> That's funny. Thank you. All right. Anyway, next question for you. Do you have a dog or a cat? No, I had one years ago. He died. Uh oh. Sorry to hear that. If you had uh, the opportunity to get a pet other than a dog or a cat, what would it be? Probably like a lion. <laughs> By the way, just to let you know, I mean, lions eat steak. Steak is expensive. 
Yeah. Just, just saying. I mean, I know you got lots of money, but that's a that's expensive pet to keep. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So maybe you need to downsize a little bit. Pet, pet for a while. <laughs> you know, someone else said they'd have a hamster. I'm like, a hamster? But you know what? If you think about it, they don't eat, really eat too much. No. And they just, they just, you don't have to walk them, you know? All that stuff. Anyway, um, good answer, though. I like the lion one. That's pretty cool. And uh, lastly, quick, easy, super easy question. Just kidding. If you had the chance to have a drink, dinner, et cetera, with three people, alive or dead, who would they be? Dead, I'm going to rock with Martin Luther King. Got to go with Jesus. <laughs> Lastly, I think I like Warren Buffett. I watch him a lot. Wow. You know what's incredible? I won't tell you who, but another guest listed um, MLK, Warren Buffett, and then Bill Gates. Um, but it's interesting, two out of three. Um, and then someone else, because, you know, it's funny. is when I hear that, those, those are great choices, by the way. When I hear people uh, say that, I mean, give their choices, it's interesting that most people do current, current people. And I always wondered, what would it be like to sit down with, like, Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or Napoleon or, you know, these men or women from, or, I mean, look, you said Jesus. I mean, can you imagine sitting down with Jesus? I mean, you know, uh, how incredible that would be, right? Um, whether you believe in him or you don't believe in whatever it is, I mean, it's incredible. And right. But people sort of focus on, oh, they say Oprah or they say whatever. And I said, eh, I don't know, man. I, I think I'd rather hang with, I mean, so great choices. I like them. Um, well, look, this has been awesome, Derek. I mean, the, our time flew by, man. We, like I said, we can, we can go at this for, uh, you know, let me take a step back. You know, a quick thing. I was on a panel recently for, for podcasters and someone asked the, asked the question, you know, what is the best length of time for a podcast? You know, is it like 30 minutes? Is it 40? You know, what is it? And, um, you know, the guy answered, he says, and he's like some professional, he knows all this stuff for the statistics. And everything. he says, look, you could have a two minute or three minute or five minute podcast that people tune out after 20 seconds because you're boring, or you could have a six hour one and people are engaged and listen and they may need to visit it a couple of times, but they'll listen. So it doesn't matter. And that just tells me, I mean, we could go on for six hours. This is great. So I really appreciate you being on Derek. You're a, look, I love the work that you're doing. I think it's fabulous. I love your story. It's a great one. And, you know, I think what, makes you qualified to do the work that you do is not just your your experience but you know what you bring inside and as you said that little bit of the chip on the shoulder is really what's what's driving you to succeed so thanks again for for being on i really appreciate it man thank you for having me mark and man keep up the great work you're doing incredible stuff man uh, i know we'll be doing some more stuff together in the future we will certainly be doing that thanks again derek have a great rest of your day i will man you do the same Thanks so much for joining us today on this episode of Make Your Mark Podcast. The goal of the podcast is to help you find ways to make your mark, to succeed in life, and to jump past your competition. Be sure to leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher and subscribe to be the first to hear new episodes. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email, mark at markmoyer.com, and I'll get back to you right away. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.